Thank you. I was walking around outside uh, before class, thinking I might throw up or something, and uh, there was a guy flying a kite over by the highway. He was flying a kite. He had a, obviously flown a kite before. He had a, a fishing rod and the kite attached to it, and he couldn't get it going. And he shouted, he could see I was watching him, and he shouted, you know, the wind keeps dying down. So he stuck it eventually into the limbs of a tree that he could reach. And he backed way up, and eventually, somehow or other, he had detached it from the limbs, and it took off. And I thought, there's something in that. I don't know what the heck it is, but there's something. <laughs> It was fascinating. I gave him applause and I said, you got it up, you got it. So that's what I did during lunch. My topic today was to uh, talk about the instinctive motion. And uh, as I've said to a few people, probably more vehemently than uh, I should have, I said, what is the deal with people just talking about movement? Movement comes in various sorts. This requires a certain modifier. There are some movements that make us better and some people some movements that make us worse. Among the origins of pain, the first and foremost that we can treat as movement therapists is mechanical deformation of the nervous system. To my knowledge, this is what's going on. And when you mechanically deform the nervous tissue increasingly in the wrong way, well, the movement's not going to help you. It'll probably make you worse. It'll add more input of uh, nociceptive uh, firing to the system. Bingo. There's a good chance that's going to work, unless there's a loved one standing nearby, because context is more important. But like this guy with the wind and the uh, kite this afternoon, there's a tremendous amount of uh, disparity in, in what's going to happen next. I don't call the neural matrix, uh, uh, Melzack's neural matrix uh, model, because as Quinter has pointed out, models predict things. And what what Melzack did with the neural matrix was develop a conceptual framework. He says this is a way to think about pain that makes sense, that is defensible, in fact. And if you look at it that way, then it, it doesn't predict anything. Why can't we predict what's going to happen with our patients next? Because of the shape of the system. How long ago did they come up with uh, five-day weather forecasts? You know, it used to be just three days, now they're five days. They waited until the year 2000 to come up with the five day, and the five day is not particularly good. The butterfly effect, the fact that a small butterfly flapping its wings, was first discovered in 1960 for crying out loud. 1960, I was nine years old. And in all that time, they found that just a, there are a lot of butterflies out there, just a, a small perturbation in the atmosphere can change things. And that's because of the shape of the weather, which is a fractal, which is chaotic. Something we've learned a, late, a great deal more about in the last 40 years, a lot more. And there are shapes of certain organs within our bodies that are in fact fractal, that are shaped uh, in the same way a cloud would be shaped. What happens when you press on a cloud? Who the hell knows? I mean, if the one thing's gonna change, and it, a lot might happen and nothing might happen, and this is exactly what we have difficulty predicting with this sort of thing. As I wrote in one of my most famous essays on my website, uh, Do Nothing. That was the entire title, Do Nothing, with the patient. I should have titled it, Do Nothing, but Understand as Much as You Possibly Can. We need to understand things, not to know things, but to understand things, because in science all knowledge is provisional. So we need to understand as much as we possibly can about what's going on with the patient, and we need to proceed from there. Understanding as well that no matter what we do, it might or might not make a big difference to the patient. It's reasonable to assume, it seems to me, and this is something I assumed many, many years ago, that there is within the human body an instinct to survive. I mean, we wouldn't have survived as a species unless there was an instinct to survive, and part of that was our movement. All of you are shifting in your chairs. All of you are shifting in your chairs at the moment. You aren't doing this with any plan or willful intent. In 1852, this was identified in the neurology community as idiomotion. I, I understand that uh, elsewhere in the world they might call it idiomotion, but I pronounce it as you would in Ohio, idiomotion. <laughs> Northeast Ohio, in any case. 